31 years ago today, for me and Leanne, we celebrated our very first Sunday in leadership at Thompson Station Church. Today we're thrilled to be celebrating 31 years together. In the fall of 1988, I was finishing up a couple of master's degrees to graduate in December. Leanne had already finished her master's in May and was working full-time supporting her lazy student husband, which I am grateful. She's been carrying me all of my adult life. Thank you, Jesus. So, because December was coming and graduation was coming, knowing that I would need to find a place of service, Leanne and I began to pray together. And I remember it distinctly that in September and October, we had a little apartment um, with used furniture from the Goodwill store or used furniture store. And we just knelt down in our little bedroom by the bed and we just began to pray, God, wherever you want us to go, that's where we want to go. And we're wide open to it. But then I would always add an addendum. Lord, it sure would be good if it was a great state of Tennessee. I mean, I can't help it. I was born in Nashville. I love Tennessee, specifically Middle Tennessee, but I'm just a volunteer at heart. So I, I was selfishly praying, God, we'll go anywhere. Sure would be great if it was Tennessee. We got calls from all over the nation and had conversations with churches from, my dad used to say, Dan to Beersheba. I didn't know what that meant, but if you look at the nation of Israel... Dan is way into the north, and Beersheba, Beersheba in the Israel, they do B's and V's reverse, Beersheba, Beersheba is down south. And we got a call from Alexandria, Virginia. Wouldn't that be a redneck from Tennessee up there by Washington, D.C.? I'd have been a great hit, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, we got a call from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I knew God wasn't in that. <laughs> Some things you ain't got to pray about. <laughs> Now, we got a call from Newport, Ritchie, Florida, which is just north of Tampa. I thought God might be calling there. We got a call from Canton, Georgia, and that was a serious call, but at the end, that didn't work out. And I think I told you a few weeks ago, we got a call from Tombstone, Arizona. I could have been the wide earth preacher of Tombstone. And we talked to a little small group of six adults. Two couples in their 60s, one couple 28 and 30, and that young couple had a four and a six-year-old. And so those six adults, and then two mother churches, First Baptist Nashville and Belmont Heights, we met with them. Listen, we, we, we knew God was in it when we met with them on Henpeck Lane. They needed a Henpeck preacher, and we met on Henpeck Lane. So we were having a conversation, and during that conversation about us coming here, the chairman of that pulpit committee said, Tom, we're just a little church, and we don't need much of a preacher. We think you'll do. <laughs> so God worked it out, and, and here we are. And 31 years later, y'all have tolerated me and enjoyed Leanne, and we're thrilled to be here. But I remember as we were praying in the fall of 1988, all kinds of questions were going through my mind all kinds of things that made me nervous and and you know I, I grew up an extrovert and and uh, and I for lack of a better phrase I didn't really lack for confidence and yet I was going into a field where I'd never been I was doing something I'd never done I I'd preached just a few times now I'm thinking I got to preach multiple times and then I've got to lead a people. Even if it's not a lot of people, I've got to lead people. I've really never been a leader of people. I've never worked in a church full time. Yeah, I've seen my dad do it, but my dad, he, he, was, he was trained and educated and good and experienced. But I, I was a little scared. And yet we knew that God was calling us to this ministry. We were also excited and hopeful. And when I think about how I felt at that time, I, today I think that a man that we're going to study perhaps felt just like I felt. Doing something he had never done before in a position that he necessarily hadn't had any experience in. And we're going to talk about him from Joshua chapter 1. So take your Bibles and go to Joshua 1. Let's look at Joshua when he transitioned from being second to being first. From being one who was under authority to being one in the highest place of human authority over the nation of Israel. Joshua chapter 1. This, if you're new to Thompson Station, 
Let me share with you that this scripture, Joshua chapter 1, is the same scripture I preached 31 years ago on the fourth Sunday of January in 1989. I preached this scripture 30 times in 31 years. In one year, I have to look and see which it was. One year, I just got this, I got this feeling. I said, I'm not going to do it this year. I don't know why I didn't. So I went off script, but I had to quickly come back. Because this is a powerful testimony of God speaking to a leader and his people and saying, I have big things for you. Go out and live it out. And that's why I've come back to this scripture as our annual sermon scripture. Now, we are in the month of prayer. We, we're in a, in a series of, of messages on prayer. We just came off a 21-day fast, many of us, over 200 of you. Thank you for participating And as you read this scripture, you'll think, Tom, I'm not sure this scripture really is so much about prayer. And I I would beg to have discussion with you about that. Because what you see going on here is a conversation, if you will, a discussion, a dialogue between God and between a man that he's raising up, a person he's raising up for leadership in his kingdom's work. And I think it puts a lot of emphasis on an area of prayer that we're not that good in. And that's listening. Many of us have our prayer list, and we might pray 10, 15, some of us spiritual, those of you are spiritual, 20 minutes. But most of our prayer lives are asking God to do something for us or to give us something or to remove a burden or change a situation. And we don't spend much time listening to what he has to say. So I would say anytime there's a There is a dialogue between God and man. That is prayer. I would dare say this is a conversation of prayer. And Joshua's doing the listening. So let's look in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. If you found that in your Bible, either your hard copy or your electronic, say got it. I hope that if you're at home, that you'll open your copy of God's Word as you watch this live stream. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, his assistant. The Lord said, we talked about it a week or so ago, God still speaks. So Joshua's listening, let's listen. My servant, Moses, is dead. Now, then, that's done with. He's not coming back. You, Joshua, and all these people, maybe two million of them, you get ready, get ready, get ready, because you're going to cross this Jordan into the land I am about to give them to all the nation of Israel. I will give you every place where your foot treads. One translation, I believe the King James says, every place upon the sole of your foot treads I have given you. That's actually the best translation, I have given you. It's past tense. It, not, it doesn't mean I will give it to you. It says, I have given it to you, and the only thing you have to do is possess it. Take what I've given you. It's already there. It's yours. It's in your bank account. Receive it. I'll give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised. Your territory will extend a a great amount of distance. Then look at verse 5. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Look at verse 7. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to obey all the law My servant Moses gave to you, do not turn from it to the right or the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. Today's message is entitled, The Promise of God. God made the nation of Israel, God made Joshua a promise. God is still making promises to us today. And God is still a promise keeper. I hope that today during this message, our hearts will be open to hear the Spirit speak through His Word and to remind us of a promise He made or to give us a promise that we haven't quite seen yet before and grab hold of that. And God's promises are true and He is faithful to them. Let's pray together. God, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the joy of worship. Thank You for calling us to assemble here in Your name to worship Your holy name. And thank you for your word that we might learn from it and apply it. God, that we would leave this place different, committed to you and your word to take every promise that you give and hold to that and live that out in belief of your faithfulness. So help me. 
I need you, Jesus. I, Holy Spirit, I surrender. Fill me even now. Holy Spirit, fill me. Give my mind your thoughts, my mouth your words to challenge your church today. Lord Jesus, we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to give you four or five thoughts in kind of a, a running order. And the first thought I'm going to give you is actually the, the main theme. It's the title of this message. The promise of God is also point number one if you're naking, taking notes or if you're following in your app. You, verse 2, and all these people, Joshua, get ready. I'm about to give them the land of promise. Look at verse 2 again. Into a land I'm about to give to them. I want to I stop there for a moment. I want us to be reminded this morning that it is the nature of our God to give. Our God is a giving God. Our God is not a stingy God. Our God is not a God that says, you know, our God's not a God that says, I, I, I like to tease you and withhold from you. Our God is not a God who tries to bait us. He's not one who just says, oh, you might have it, you might not have it. Our God is a giving God. It has been his nature to give. Even when he first created Adam and Eve, and you think about all that was surrounded, all they were surrounded with, the, the beauty and glory and majesty of the Garden of Eden, perfection to its fullest. That was the gift. And all they had to do is tend to the animals and the fruit trees, and everything flourished. And, and we'd still be in that today had they not sinned against God. And by the way, our God is such a giving God that one day he'll restore all of that. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And all that was that God intended will be in that day. By the way, study on heaven. Larry gave many of us on staff a book. Alcorn is his last name. And man, I'm studying that during my quiet time. It's powerful. If you want to learn more about heaven, just get his 50-day devotional book. I mean, it just gives a synopsis of his other studies. Alcorn, the last name, A-L-C-O-R-N, a book on heaven. Man, it's powerful. If you have this idea that one day you're going to go to heaven, you're going to be floating, strumming a little harp on some, that's not it at all. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth, and we'll rule on that earth. We'll reign on that earth. We'll get, re get resurrected bodies. We'll know each other. We'll have community, and we'll have things to do. And that'll be a joy, being where God intended us to be in the new heaven and the new earth as they're together. And that's a promise of God. Now think about this gift that God's giving them. He's giving them this promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now think about where these people are coming from. Remember, these people going into the promised land, 40 years, four decades, they've been living in a desert. Prior to their existence, their forefathers and foremothers had four centuries in slavery in Egypt. This is a people who are downtrodden, beaten up, worn out. They were tired. Slavery, then the desert. And you know what I call those 40 years? I call those the 40 years of M&Ms. You say, there was no M&Ms in the desert. Mars up here. Well, they don't make candy. They do dog food. But if you go up there, they got candy everywhere. Stop by someday. I've been there. I've been in the whole thing. Candy bowls everywhere. I love it. And, if they're in, in, and then when they're not looking, you take them and put them in your pockets. I'm just teasing. They give it to you if you can get through the security gate. <laughs> Mars, I'm, I'm thankful for Mars in our community. Listen, Eminem, what's that mean? Every day, manna, manna, manna. And then every few weeks, move, move, move. Eminem, they're manna and move. Think about that life for four decades. What if your life full with you ate the same thing over and over and over? Some of you couldn't make 21 days without a chocolate chip cookie. What about 40 years of manna? Manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for supper, manna for a midnight snack. What are we going to have tomorrow, Mama? Manna. <laughs> I mean, you knew what was coming. 40 years of manna. And then you have to pack up, take down that tent, and move. When that pillar of fire or that cloud by day, that light by night, if that moved, you moved. These guys are ready to receive the promise of security and a place called mine. Remember, every tribe got their own community. They could settle. They could build houses. Then they could farm the land. They could raise their crops and raise their animals and have a place to call home. Friends, we all want a place to call home. We want a place that we can say, I'm secure and safe here. Let me tell you something. If you're looking for safety and security in this world, you're looking in the wrong place. 
I'm thankful for a house over my head, a car to drive. I'm, I'm thankful that, that I, we have food to, that, that we can feed ourselves, feed our kids and grandkids. But our security is not found in this world. Our security is found in another world. And it's found in his name, Jesus. Our safety and our security and our sustenance is in Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, you want a promised land? Let me give you one that's far greater than Canaan. Let me give you a promise of Jesus Christ, the eternal promise. That's where we find our security. God is giving us an eternity with him in a land that never fades, that never fails. He says, come to me if you're weary. Not only is there this promise. I want you to know that our God is not a small God. His promises are big. Verse 4 says, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river Euphrates, all the Hittite country, all the way to the great sea, Mediterranean on the west. There's a big amount of area. And you know what it says? All you got to do, I've already given it to you, is just walk on it. Walk on it, I've given it to you. That's why I preached this very first sermon here 31 years ago, is when God sent me and Leanne here. Some of you have heard the story 20 times, but let me tell it again for those of you who are new. Leanne and I knocked on doors. Back then, you had to like drive from driveway to driveway and walk down gravel. The only subdivision was Buckner Place, being dug in. That's where we had our first house. Cameron Farms was just down the road. I think that's the only one that I remember existing. Everything else, imagine from here to Spring Hill, nothing between there. Nothing except the Bubba Dome. What's the Bubba Dome? It's where they, it's that big metal thing where they rode, they rode, they roped and rode their horses under a metal thing. We call it the Bubba Dome. They would meet there and do their rodeo. Think about nothing. And, and, and you know what God said? Go knock on their door. I used to visit Monday, Tuesday night, Thursday, and Saturday morning. I just knock on doors and walk. I want to tell you something about the Israelites. Here it is. Listen to this. The commentaries I read this week, they only occupied 10% of what was promised. Think about that. They left 90% of what God wanted them to have it uninhabited, unpossessed, untaken. And all I can think is, is because they didn't step out in faith to where, to where God said. It was laid out and yet they stopped. How many of us are only occupying 10% of the blessing God wants to give you, your family, or our church? Because we're short on faith. We're short on stamina. We're short on courage. We're short on belief. God help us possess all that he wants to give us. His promises are big. That's what I'm telling you. We don't have a tiny God. Quit asking God for tiny stuff. Let's ask God for big, bold stuff that God has to come through or it isn't happening. That's what faith is. That's what we need to learn. I need to learn to exercise and fully occupy all that God has for us. God's promises are not only big, but the good thing about God's promises is they're guaranteed. There, there's no question mark on a promise from God. There's no maybe on a promise from God. It is a guarantee. The land that I'm giving to them. Verse 2. I'm giving to them. Hebrews six thirteen. Here's an interesting parallel. When God made his promise, just write it down, Hebrews 6, 13, you don't have to go there. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. Like when you and I go to the court of law, thankfully I haven't been in the court in a while, at least for anything I've done wrong. I don't know, if they, do they still do it? You lawyers and doctors and any chief, do you, do you till put your hand on the Bible and say, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God? I don't know if we even do that in our secular society. We used to do that. Friends, God doesn't put his hand on any Bible. God puts his heart, hand on his own heart, the heart of God. He says, I swear by myself, what I say I mean, what I say I do. You can, you can be guaranteed God is a promise keeper. His promises are guaranteed. Matter of fact, way back in Genesis 22, you ought to read this again this afternoon. Uh, this is where, the, where Abraham was, 
was called of God to sacrifice his son Isaac, and he took him to the top of Mount Moriah there, the, 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 the mountain of God, and he was all set to slay the boy with a knife, and God stayed his hand. He said, I know you have a heart for me. And there was a ram with his horns caught in a thicket, and he ended up that, taking that. And then what he says in Genesis 22, he says this, Verse 16, Genesis 22. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your only son from me, I'm surely going to bless you. I'm going to multiply your offspring as the stars of the heavens and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the gate of its enemies. I'm telling you, Israel prospers. Every time, every time people try to oppress them, they just prosper. They are brilliant in technology. They're brilliant in hydrology. I've told you before. 22% of all Nobel Peace Prizes have been won by Israelite Jewish people. They're less than probably 1% of the population in the world. I can't figure that out. There's like 9 million Jews in the world, and there's 7.5 7 billion people in the world. They always prosper. They're the chosen children of God. That all comes from Abraham's obedience. But that's not even the greatest thing God promised. Listen to this. When we obey God and receive his promises and cash in his promises, other people are blessed by that. Not just Israel. Listen to this. Your, verse 18, write it down, Genesis 22. In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. I'm not Jewish. I'm a Gentile. Now, how am I blessed in his offspring? The Lord Jesus Christ is in the lineage of Abraham. Every person that's ever come to Christ has come partially out of Abraham's obedience. Every person can come to Jesus, no matter what your lineage, what your ancestry. Now, we need to ask God for big things. Don't be afraid to ask. F.B. Meyer, I may have told you last week, I'll tell you again, the tragedy, the greatest tragedy in life is not unanswered prayer, it's unoffered prayer. What prayers are we not praying so that, God, I won't be short of your best for me and my family and the church that I love. God, I don't want just 10% of what you want to give me. I want to reach the fullest potential for me, for my family, for my kids and grandkids and for the church that I serve. That's the... Uh, promise of God. How, let's, let's move to another thought, the presence of God. Verse 5, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. Can you imagine how encouraging, reassuring this is? A statement to Joshua in this historic moment, a transition of power. The greatest, most powerful leader that Israel had ever known just died, and all the pressure of guiding and leading and feeding and protecting falls on you. The entire nation sits on your shoulders. Mo uh, Moses is gone. Joshua must be feeling the heaviness of this situation. He had a dear friend, 40 years, and he's gone. Moses had already always been the wisdom. Joshua always took the lead, and now he's here. And then in that calamity, in that confusion, in that clatter, in the noise in his own brain, God speaks calm into that confusion. He said, hey, 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 right here. Look, focus on me. That's what God says. Don't let the clatter out there. Yeah, there's some people saying, I don't know if Joseph can lead us well. All he does is kill people. He's a soldier. He, how's he going to lead us? A lot of that out there. But even, that might be hurtful. But in our lives, you know where the most of the noise and clatter is? It's not out there. You know where it is? It's right here. Our insecurities come to haunt us and say, I don't know if I can do this. This is new. I'm not sure I'm capable. I've not been trained for that. I've not been educated for that. What if I don't do well? I, he probably had some, something in here, and God speaks into that. He says, I'm with you. That's enough. You know, we, we can go around the world and come back. But let me tell you, Jesus is enough. He's enough. God's presence is enough. God's presence is enough. Would you say that out loud with me? Here we go. One, two, three. God's presence is enough. It is. And so I think that's what God's reminding Joshua in this moment. And then, and then I think the Lord is reminding Joshua. He said, okay, what did this God do who was with Moses who's now with me? What did this God do? And then he remembered, oh, that's where those ten plagues, those ten miracles of Egypt, that's where all those frogs happened, all those boils. And that's where the, that's where the death angel 
came over and every firstborn in Egypt died, but not in Israel. Oh, that's the God who, when I was panicking, because here comes the army of Egypt. Here comes Pharaoh and his army. They're not going to capture us for slavery. They're going to capture us for slaughter. This time they're coming for blood. And I got all two million of us with women and children, babies crying, and this water. And I, we're going to either die by drowning or die by the sword. And I was trying to scamper in my mind thinking, how can I defend us, which was an impossible situation. And I looked up. Joshua remembers, I looked up. And God and Moses were having a conversation. And Moses stood up with his arms lifted and the rod of God in his hand. And the sea parted. He said, oh, 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 oh. If that God who was with Moses is with me, I can do this. See, friends, if you remember the God that was with Moses and the God that was with Joshua, the God that was with Peter and the God that was with Paul is the same God that's with you. The presence of God is enough. No matter what army, what desert, what ocean is before you. God's enough. God's enough. That's his presence. Cling to his presence. Got more. The power. You've got the power of God available to you. No one will be able to stand against you. Verse 5. I'll be with you. I'm never going to leave or forsake you, just like I was with Moses. No man can stand against you all the days of your life. There's a promise God makes that my power is your power. The power of God. The power of God that through the stars in space with a voice, go stars, be there, appear, out of nothing, boom. The power that opened the Red Sea for the children. The power of God. That power is available to Joshua. Victory is assured. That power is is available for us. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. My power is available to you. No need to fear. Some principles. The principles of God we found in the scripture in 7 and 8. Be careful to obey the law. It's the Old Testament books, the Pentateuch, that Moses gave you. All the teachings. Don't turn right or left. And if you'll follow it, obey it, success will be with you wherever you go. Be careful to obey everything. And then you'll be prosperous and successful. Verse 8. Man, I don't know anybody in this room, anybody watching by live stream, who isn't interested in success. And there's two simple steps, really one step and then one result. And let me share those about the principles of God. First, it's not easy. Okay, okay, I know it's not easy, but we got to obey. We got to obey God. We got to obey His word. That's that's what it says. Be careful to obey. If we want to obey it, we got to know it. So verse eight says, "Hey, study it, think on it, meditate on it. Let it be a part of your life every day. Take part of it. You don't just." You you, you don't just eat every six days. You eat like daily. Don't just take this every sixth or seventh day. Take some of it daily. As food is to the physical body, so God's word is to your spiritual body, your spiritual nature. And obedience is hard. You know, I'm not up here pretending what I'm asking is easy. It's hard for me. You know why? I want to do what I want to do. And sometimes what I want to do isn't exactly what God wants me to do. And then i got to make a choice, just like you. Who would I rather run my life and bring the best result from my life so that I could maximize my potential as a husband, father, grandfather, and pastor, where I could go past the 10% and get toward the 100% God has me? Who could do a better job? Let's see. Tom, who's flawed and broken and messed up and, and, uh, and just, just name it. And or God Almighty, King of the Universe. Mm, let me see. Let's see. Tom or God? Tom or God? Let me pray about it. Uh, well, God. God can do a better job with me than I can do with me. So I need to humble myself and obey. Now, here, the, here, the best part of this is the, the promise in this. And maybe we should think a little more about the promise on the other side. It'll help us with the obedience on this side. The promise is, verse 8, I'm not making this up. God said this. 
then you will be prosperous and successful. Some of us live at our success because we've limited our obedience. Maybe to the extent we obey is to the extent we succeed. I'm not God. I, I can't answer that question. God could not have made it any clearer to Joshua, cannot have made it any clearer to us. These statements are intertwined forever. Obey God and experience His blessing. I think God can do a better job with me and my family and the church I serve than I can. And I don't want to be too forward or too presumptuous, but I'm like 100% sure that God could do better with you than you could do better with you, than you could. And you say, well, you don't even know. I don't have to know you. For all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Friends, it's just him. There's just Jesus, remember? You've been here a week or two, you've heard me. There's just Jesus, and then there's all the rest of us. All right? It's not like Jesus and then Billy Graham and, you know, name, name you know, Stephen Olford or, or Stephen Furtick. Just name your favorite. It's not Jesus, then them, then the rest of us. It's just Jesus and then all of us. And you know what? We all do better with him as the boss of our lives. In the 1830s and 1840s, something was rising up that revolutionized, at that time, our nation. It's called the telegraph. Now, this, listen, take note, some of you young people. There was a day when you, to communicate with somebody far away, there had to be actual a line of some kind that goes from here to there. I know y'all don't live in that. You, you think that these always existed. And that somehow it goes through the air. There was a day when you had to actually have a line. So telegraph was invented by a man named Morse. You know that the Samuel Morse invented Morse code. M-O-R-S-E. So in the 1830s, as it was beginning to cross our nation, there was a company in this business, and it was prospering, and he needed to, to hire a new Morse code operator. So he let it be known in his town and in his community in the local newspaper. So the day of the interview, there were seven young men in the waiting office, and all the men came in, and in this little reception area, there was a, there was a sign. It says, if you're coming for the interview for Morris Code Operator, please wait in the waiting room. You'll be summoned. And this is a busy office, a prospering office. There were, there were people working everywhere. There was clatter, and there was telegraph in the background, and there was noise and shuffling of papers and conversations of people coming and going. So one by one, these seven filed in, and none of them were summoned for an interview. Then an eighth young man came in, and he sat down. These others had been waiting for minutes, if not over an hour. Then, after a very short amount of time, the last young man in jumped up, Walked to the inner office door, just opened the door, walked in and shut it behind him. The other seven guys are looking at each other and say, what's up with that? He was last. He's going to get kicked out. He's going to void, you know, make his interview null and void, and he'll be dismissed. One of us will get it. Just like a few minutes later, the owner of the company opens the door, says to the seventh guy, seven guys, hey, guys, thanks for stopping in. The job has been filled. This man has the job. Oh, you, you should have heard the grumbling brr, 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 and the fussing. Brr, brr, brr. Finally, one of the men got his guts up. That's what my kids say. Got his courage up and said, hey, by far he was the last man in. All seven of us were earlier. We didn't even get an interview. That's not fair. To which the owner said, every one of you seven were sitting there, some of you for 30 minutes, some of you for an hour and 30 minutes, and not one of you noticed that in the background of all this noise and clutter, we were pressing out. On the little mechanism, Morse code. If you can hear this and you understand this, come through the inner office door immediately. The job will be yours. He heard it. He walked in the office. He got the job. He walked out employed. Friends, there's nobody in this room who doesn't deal with noise, confusion, and clatter out here. There's probably nobody in here that doesn't deal with noise and clatter in here. That's when, like Joshua, somehow we need to steal our hearts in a time with God so we can hear God speak to us. I'm with you. 
You've got my power. You've got my presence. And that's enough. You win. You win. Let's bow our heads. God, somehow through the clatter of life, the noise of life, would you help us to quiet our minds and our spirits enough to hear your whisper?